to today's lecture, the 10th in the, in the current topic series. As I said last week, most of the lectures have focused primarily on the genomic analysis of mammalian systems. Last week, we took a departure from that topic and talked about how to analyze the microbes that live on and, on, on and inside of us and how their composition may differ both between people and between healthy and diseased states. Today, we're going to explore another way that people differ from each other, namely in their response to medicine. Our speaker this morning is Howard McLeod from the University of North Carolina. Dr. McLeod's field of expertise is in integrating genetics principles into clinical practice to advance personalized medicine. Dr. McLeod is a Fred N. Eshelman Distinguished Professor and the Director of the UNC Institute for Pharmacogenomics and, Insti and Individualized Therapy. He's also a principal investigator for the CREATE Pharmacogenetic Research Network, a network of labs evaluating pathways regulating drug activity. He's also a member of the FDA Committee on Clinical Pharmacology, and he directs the Pharmacogenomics for Every Nation Initiative, which aims to help developing countries use genetic information to improve national drug formulary decisions. Please welcome me in, please, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. McLeod to give this morning's lecture on pharmacogenomics. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to be here and, and to uh, talk to, to this audience. Um, there's uh, many of the aspects of, of uh, genomics that you know uh, much more about than, than I do. And so I'm going to uh, try to tell you a bit about how we're trying to use the genome uh, for, for good uh, and hopefully not evil, uh, although I'll, I'll hit on some of the evil part as, as well as we're, as we're going forward. Uh, but the, the area of, of pharmacogenomics is one that has been hyped up quite a lot in terms of trying to uh, use genetic information for uh, making decisions about medicines. And so I, I will hopefully uh, talk through um, some of the realities of where we are currently, including uh, some of the discovery pieces that, that need to be done. And so uh, it, it won't just be on, on a late clinical application, uh, but we'll start off on some of the discovery um, um, aspects there. Now I, I like to start with uh, this quote here, a, a surgeon who uses the wrong side of the scalpel cuts her own fingers and not the patient. If the same applied to drugs, they would have been investigated very carefully a long time ago. Now, this quote is supposedly from 1849. Uh, I don't read this particular journal. Uh, but it's, it's very true today that of the FDA-approved drugs that we have available in this country, there are none of them that we truly know the mechanism of action. Now, if you're a student or a fellow or something like that and you have to take an exam, there's, of course, a right answer of, of, of how a drug works. And you have to uh, pretend that that's the truth. But the reality is we don't know how drugs work. We, we know that they hit certain targets, and we often label them by that. But COX-2 inhibitors have activity in COX-2 knockout mice. And topo isomerase 1 inhibitors have activity independent of topo-1 levels. And the list goes on. And so we know something about medicines, but not enough about medicines to really dial in the right one for, for each individual person. And so if you take a group of people with your favorite disease, treat them with your favorite therapy, in retrospect, people will stand out. And they'll stand out for two important reasons, a, a lack of therapeutic benefit and unacceptable levels of, of toxicity. And so the goal is how do we, uh, take, how do we go and take this uh, uh, take knowledge about the patient and try to make it so that this, these folks here get an alternate therapy rather than the usual therapy that, that we, we might give. Now, the, the clinical problem that we have in the therapeutic side is really a, a wonderful problem. Uh, the, the, uh, there's quite a lot of, of uh, young-looking people in, in the audience. Not everyone, of course, but uh, there's quite a lot of young-looking people in the audience. Um, and so you may not realize that it wasn't that long ago that there weren't a lot of choices for, for most common diseases. If you take the area of cancer, where I spend a lot of, of my energy in the treatment of colon cancer, um, up until about 10 years ago, the big question was, do I give 5-fluorouracil by bolus or by infusion? So basically from 1958 until uh, uh, 1996, there was only one drug available for that common disease. Now there are, there are uh, four cytotoxics, three biologics, and more coming, just for the treatment of that one, one disease. And so real choices need to be made. The, the um, unfortunate truth around the modern therapies, though, is that it, with the exception of bone and mineral disease and bacterial infection, most therapies will only work in about half of the patients in which they're tried. And so you give a patient a, a drug, half of a group of patients will need to switch to a second drug. 
either sequentially or additively, um, and some will need a third drug or a fourth drug. Um, and you get to the point where uh, people switch over to homeopathy and all sorts of other things because they lose faith in the allopathic approach um, because we don't seem to know what we're doing. Uh, we have, we've tried five different, different drugs. Well, after that, why not go to quackery? Um, because it's just as good as what we were up to. Th there's also unpredictable toxicity. You know, t there's a, Dan Roden from Vanderbilt likes to say, um, can we take the idio out of idiopathic? You know, trying to make it so that we can predict some of these toxicities. But toxicities are a big deal. They happen to the patient and not the prescriber. And so they're not given the, the first priority. Uh, but they, they are a very big deal in terms of whether patients take their medicines and in terms of, of whether they're able to sustain their, uh, their therapy. Much of the modern therapy for colon cancer is incredibly active, but also harms the peripheral nerves. And so we have many situations where a patient's tumor is responding nicely, but we have to stop the therapy because we're frying their nerves. They can't button their shirt. They can't feel their fingers to do, do anything. Um, and so that situation where we cannot optimize uh, control of the disease because of toxicity um, is a, a, a big deal. Um, in the area of, of cancer, they, they grade toxicity from zero, being, meaning none, up to five, meaning uh, you actually killed the patient with the toxicity. And so when I go to the data center to look at trials that I'm running, I just say, well, just give me the, the severe toxicity, the grade three, grade four stuff. Well, if I had grade one diarrhea right now, I'd be talking to you from the little room outside there that says MEN on the door um, and not from up here. And so even a small amount of toxicity can be debilitating to a patient, um, and yet it's not even on my radar uh, because it's just such it's a pilly little problem, literally in that case, um, and uh, why, you know, why bother? And so trying to make sure we, we try to optimize both control of disease and acceptable levels of, of toxicity uh, is, uh, is an important aspect. And then there's the element that those of us on the academic side just don't want to uh, face. Um, and that is the fact that modern therapies for most diseases, certainly including cancer, cost real money. And in a, in a formerly rich country like ours, we uh, can't afford uh, the modern therapy for, for all people. And it's timely that we're talking about this today. Uh, but the, uh, having spent a, a fair amount of time in, in Europe, I was there in Scotland for, for eight years, I've, I've seen what it means to have a limited therapy budget. And when you get done with uh, that budget, there is no additional budget uh, for the therapy. And you know, if you ever wonder why clinical trials are so successful in other parts of the world, well, part of it is there, there aren't a lot of other options. Um, if you run out of your drug budget, clinical trials are often the only option uh, for the treatment of many diseases. And so can we uh, offer a patient a therapy that will optimize the control of their disease, minimize the toxicities, but in the context of, of our health system and the limited expenses. And I don't mean that we should all become health services researchers. Please do not do that. Um, but uh, rather, we need to stop thinking about things in a, such a narrow view and realize that it's the, the compilation of these, of these areas uh, that, that drive health care. And if we only do research trying to do one of these three things and ignore the rest of it, we will never succeed to the fullness that we, that we want to. Now, I, I showed this slide. It uh, looks like uh, it's stolen from a review from Elliot Vassell. It looks like I, the, the font didn't come through to give him uh, full credit. Um, and what this is showing is that genetics is at the hub of the wheel in terms of variation in drug effect. And that's great. You wouldn't have come to this talk if you didn't think uh, genetics and genomics meant something, um, unless you're really desperate for uh, continuing education credits. Um, but um, they're, they're, uh, the, genomic, the genome is certainly uh, a, a variable that is important. Looking around the room here, a lot of variability in outward appearance, much of it regulated by genetics in terms of skin pigment, hair color, some aspects of body habitus. The few of you that have met my children know they look more like me than they do you. And that's a good thing for you, bad thing for them. Uh, but the, 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 the facts are that genetics can regulate things like outward appearance. And so it's no surprise that absorption of a drug, metabolism, breakdown of a drug, uh, the amount of target uh, for a drug in a tissue can be regulated at the genetic level. But shown on the outside of the circle are a number of factors that can be very important clinically and have nothing to do with genetics in many cases. So a drug-drug interaction can be very important clinically, often has no genetic basis whatsoever. Poor kidney and liver function can be very important clinically, often has no genetic basis in terms of that. If your patients are from the, the coasts of North Carolina and are surfers, marijuana intake can influence uh, metabolism, may have no genetic influence,
but can be important in terms of the, of the, uh, the therapeutic side. And so just a reminder that the genome is a tool for understanding uh, intrapatient variability, but it is not the tool. And certainly the Genome Project has, uh, uh, during its initial uh, years, came off saying, get out of the way so we can cure your patient, as opposed to, here's a useful tool that might benefit you in understanding your patient in a much, uh, more, uh, much better way. And so we're, we're just now getting around to the point where people are willing to, to strongly consider the genome as a, a tool um, because of some of these initial issues. And so I'll try to highlight uh, where the genome is, is useful, useful, but all, also uh, the fact that we need to ask the question, is the genome useful? Um, and we'll come back to that point in a couple of slides. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the current examples that, that are out there, but I put this slide to, to show you that we are not at the beginning of pharmacogenomics. This is a list of examples where the Food and Drug Administration has changed the, the uh, uh, prescribing recommendations in the dosage and administration section of the, the package insert. This package insert is the, the aspect of, of the, uh, this section of the package insert is the aspect that all clinicians are supposed to read, and we, we know that doesn't happen. Um, all insurance companies do read in terms of their decisions, and of course they're heavily read by litigators. Um, and so uh, we're now seeing examples, not just in the clinical pharmacology section or somewhere buried deep in the package insert, but up in the drug administration section, the one that people actually have to pay attention to, for a number of different drugs. Some of these are somatic mutations, and, and you know, Philadelphia chromosome is older than most of you uh, the, in terms of its finding. Uh, HER2 is, is an old story. But other examples um, in terms of some of the HLAs for, for uh, severe hypersensitivity reaction. And then most recently, uh, um, a week ago Thursday, uh, there, the FDA put a black box for genetic information uh, uh, in terms of lack of efficacy for clopidogrel, which if you're not familiar with that drug for acute coronary syndrome, it's also known as Plavix. And if you've watched TV, you've seen a Plavix ad. It's almost as common as Viagra in terms of its, of its ads. So we're talking about now uh, drugs that you've even heard about uh, that, that have genetic information. In that case, uh, a, a large percentage of the population, about 20% about or so, uh, cannot activate this drug um, and therefore will not get uh, clinical benefit uh, from this therapy. And you don't know about it until it's too late. The person has restenosis of their stent uh, or worse. We're also talking about a number of drugs uh, that, that are commonly used across disease areas. So the 5-HT3 antagonists are used for nausea and vomiting and cancer, but they're also used for anesthesia uh, prior to, uh, to general anesthesia to prevent the, the nausea and vomiting, mainly the vomiting in that case. And so while there is a lot of cancer uh, in this country, there's a lot of surgery going on. Um, and so uh, we're, we're talking about examples where the, the thousands of patients per medical center um, are, are now eligible for genetic guided therapy uh, for, for common diseases. So it's no longer a boutique incident to some rare disease uh, where, where uh, one person in the U.S. Might, uh, might care about it, but something wh which is a, a very common, uh, a common issue. I mean, I'm going to focus in on a couple of these examples as, as we go along uh, uh, through, through this, but we're, we're not talking about a new story, but something that is, is now really uh, rolling along at a, at a fairly rapid pace. Now, I'm going to hit on three uh, fundamental issues um, as we go through these slides. Uh, first of all is uh, trying to find the, the right biomarkers, so looking at more of the discovery side of, of what's being done and what can be done to, to uh, be smarter about that. Secondly, a little bit about validation in, in terms of, of um, having proper data sets to validate um, as opposed to some of the approaches that have been taken in the past. And then lastly, actually applying this information to real people uh, for real treatment of real diseases and, and where things are in that, in, in that case. Now, the, the reason why discovery is still needed comes back to that initial slide about understanding drugs. We, we, we think we're quite smart. We can go and take a, a drug like this is a renotecan, a, a, a cancer drug. It, it goes into the cell. It can be pumped out by active transport. It can be inactivated by liver P450 enzymes. It can be activated by carboxylesterases to this metabolite, which itself can be pumped out, inactivated, hit a cellular target. Cell, there's mediators of cell death. Man, we are smart. And if I had a good graphic artist, I'd be even smarter. <laughs> so we look at this sort of thing, and we, we think we're geniuses. Except here's the real pathway. 
especially in the pharmacodynamic aspect, we, we really practice Yogi Berra pharmacology. We, we know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know. We, we, we know that these genes have the potential of being important because someone's knocked them out or overexpressed them or, or done something to substantiate that, either in the laboratory, in, in a mouse, in man. But we, we have not stepped back and asked the biology to tell us which genes should we really care about. And so often we have these pathways, and they look really slick. If you go to the pharmacogenetics knowledge base, farmgkb.org, uh, you can see these beautiful graphic artists de depicted. I think that might be me. I'll throw it over here. Uh, these be beautiful graphic artist uh, depictions of these drug pathways that really look like we understand something, but we have a long way to go. And so there is a, a lot of, t even in 2010, there's a lot of need for stepping back and asking questions about w whether we, we, uh, we, we know the right genes. And so whether it's in mouse, in families, in large uh, population studies, we need to really ask that, that question. So what, one example that, that we've done um, is to, to try to use uh, families, uh, use the family structure and all the, the, uh, the decades of, of um, knowledge about how to conduct uh, family genetic studies in the context of, of chemotherapy drugs. Now, we can't do true family studies with chemotherapy drugs. You can't bring a, a, a family, uh, a, a extended family into the clinical center here and give them all a cytotoxic chemotherapy and see who gets severe neutropenia. Uh, it's a slightly unethical. Uh, you know, you don't want to be saying, oh, sorry about grandma. You know, that's not really uh, something you want to be saying uh, with, with your studies. Um, and so because you can't do those kinds of studies, you can't do twin studies for the same reason, um, you, you, uh, what we've done is, is taken this into the in vitro setting. And one of the first questions we wanted to ask is, is cytotoxic chemotherapy response a genetic problem? Is it likely there's a genetic solution to this? And it's shocking to me, after we finally came, ar came uh, around to thinking this way, it was shocking to look at the way we've been approaching pharmacogenomics um, over the, the last uh, decade or so. We, we've assumed that genetics was relevant. And that's fine. You know, those of you that are in uh, genetics, you kind of want it to be relevant. It's your life. Well, you know, there's the old saying, you know, if you have a hammer, all the world looks like a nail. Well, if you have a sequencer or a uh, next-gen machine or whatever it might be, you know, every problem looks like a genetic problem. And, and too often what we're doing is spending a, a large amount of money to genotype or sequence or in some other way look at the genome when we don't even have a clue if genetics is involved at all. And it, it really is pretty stupid when you think about it. I know some of you are involved in, in funding decisions, and I'd like you to please forget that. But we, we really need to ask the question, should we even be uh, trying to look at, at genomics? Um, because too often, uh, we're doing it because we can, uh, not because we should. And so we ask a, a question using some of these families. And so most of you are familiar with the, uh, the Ceph uh, cell lines. They've been an important part of the Human Genome Project and the HapMap Project and, and many other projects. And you can get these cell lines from the Coriel Institute where there's, even, where there's either large uh, two-generation or more commonly three-generation families. And you can uh, take these cell lines, grow them as a, as a, uh, a culture, and do uh, cytotoxicity tests or other types of, of testing uh, depending on your, your assay. And so this is an example of, of uh, a 96 well plate. We use mainly three to four well plates now, but it's prettier uh, on the 96 well plate, um, where there's uh, two different drugs uh, uh, assayed in quadruplicate um, on, this, uh, on this plate. Um, and then there's an increasing amount of concentration of each of these drugs so that you see um, dif different levels of killing um, based on the, the, uh, the, the dye indicator, in this case, Alomar Blue, uh, being used as, as the dye. And so what you can do is from this sort of data, by, by doing, using multiple replicates, you can get kill curves. And so in this case, um, there are, are um, e each of these lines is a separate replicate for a, a specific cell line from one of these families. And with increasing concentration of the anti-cancer drug, you can see a, a rather steep killing that's going on here. Um, and the, uh, e each one of the replicates itself has 12 uh, repeats with, within it. So it's, it's 12 replicates times three. 
um, in, in, uh, for each of the, these points. And then other cell lines um, with the same number of replicates have a much more shallow kill curve. I don't know where the, yeah, there we go. Um, sorry, the mouse is, uh, there, there we are. Much more shallow kill curve um, in, in, uh, for, for this particular uh, cell line. And so you can look at the killing of, er, uh, of, uh, of, of these cells and ask the question, is this a heritable trait? How heritable is cytotoxicity? And so uh, we, we have one project that, since these are the CEPH cell lines, we call it the, uh, the CEPH-DA project, uh, where we've taken um, a, a panel of these cell lines from a number of families and taken all of the FDA-approved anti-cancer drugs, um, including some of the kinase inhibitors and demethylation drugs, et cetera, and, and uh, asked the, the question about heritability. We, we did not use um, some of the drugs that needed activation. So there are many drugs that are pro-drugs. You, you swallow them, they have to be activated in the liver before they can work in the body. Um, that's difficult to do in, in cell culture, so we didn't, uh, we didn't attempt that. But by, by taking these, uh, we can generate this kind of data. Now, let me walk you through it briefly. What this is showing is a series of, of anti-cancer drugs, um, most of them fairly commonly prescribed anti-cancer drugs, um, either corrected for growth, uh, for growth rate or uncorrected for growth rate. On this axis is heritability uh, of, of the, 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 the maximum heritability um, across several concentrations for each drug. Over on the left side here are the controls. So 1% DMSO, water, or media with serum, um, depending on, uh, as, as the various controls for this experiment. And so what you can see is that there is a, a degree of, of, um, of, of heritability seen um, across the different anti-cancer drugs, such that some of them, such as uh, epirubicin or temozolomide, um, have a very high heritability, up in the 60% range, um, and then some of them are really no different from control in terms of heritability. Now, this is cell lines. These are lymphoblastoid cell lines. There's uh, a number of assumptions and limitations with this system, but it is one of the few ways that one can ask the question, which drugs are more likely uh, to, to have uh, a, a, um, a high level of, ge of genetic influence going on. Now, heritability is only one measure of, of trying to look at uh, whether genetics is relevant, and, and we're, we're well aware of that. But what we are seeing is that it, we have some drugs uh, with a very high level of heritability um, and are, are much more likely to be, uh, to be a, the source uh, of, uh, of genomic discovery other drugs at the low end, we don't know exactly why they're, they're low. It's not a lack of variability in cytotoxicity. It's just a lack of heritability. Um, and so we, we think that, and it is not EBV transform, for, transformation. We've, we've looked into that part of it. Um, but we're still trying to figure out, uh, does this mean these drugs should never have genetic studies? Um, or does it mean that we, this assay just isn't good enough uh, in terms of trying to prioritize drugs? But it gives us a, an ability to, to put some context into whether a, a genomic discovery approach is likely to have high utility or whether it's going to be a relatively low yield exercise. And this sort of data really should be generated for every aspect of pharmacogenetics, not by us. I'm not, I'm not trying to plug that we should do it all. Um, please, I do not want that. Um, but I, I do think that a question that needs to be asked is, is really, is genetics likely to give us the answer we want? Um, and and uh, you know, can we prioritize this? Now, using these families, one can do old, good old-fashioned linkage analysis. Um, and uh, uh, thankfully, we have some old-timers around UNC that remember how to do that sort of thing. Uh, it's gotten so trendy to do uh, uh, genome-wide association, et cetera, um, that uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the young folks don't, uh, don't know about that except for their history of genetics class. Uh, but we can go and, and, and look across the, the genome. And more importantly, we can look within families of, of anti-cancer drugs. So, Take a, a family of drugs where there, there is a, a multiple members that are used clinically uh, that are within the same chemical class. And so in this case, it's two of the fluoroprimidines that are out there. And there are examples, such as this little box here, of, of peaks um, that are where there seems to be some level of association, in this case not a very high level of association, uh, between cytotoxicity and this region of the genome. And then there are other areas where there's a, a, a rather um, high-level peak, at least for this cell system, um, in both members of this family. And so we have examples, for example, the, with the, uh, the camptothecins, uh, where we were able to go and pull out uh, peaks that were common to the initial six uh, clinically used camptothecins uh, that, uh, that, that we have, 
um, and then go in and validate that, uh, those findings with additional experimental campithecins, uh, ones that have not gone into to humans, um, to, to try to look at replication of these peaks and are finding peaks that are not at a place where we have a known target, um, but seem to replicate across the family uh, for, for, for this area. And so one can look under these, these quantitative trait loci um, and start to ask the question, well, why um, is, is there a, an association uh, between this region of the genome and cytotoxicity for this family of drugs? Now, of course, we have the problem that we always have, whether it's expression arrays or, or uh, linkage analysis or genome-wide association analysis. When you put together your list of genes under a particular region of the genome, th they all have the perfect story for why they are the right one. So this is the start of a lot of work, not the end of a lot of work. And, and thankfully, we have a, a um, shRNA library where we have five clones for every known human gene. We're able to scan through um, using uh, other, some cell-based systems uh, to try to identify which genes under the QTL are important. But this, this um, concept of narrowing the genome down from a lot of genes down to a focused number of genes to try to do new discoveries in terms of mechanism of action um, is one way of trying to revisit uh, this, this important area. And, you know, this is no surprise. The approach I laid out is one that has been used for years with disease genetics. But pharmacogenetics is really derived out of clinical pharmacology. There are very few geneticists who are applying strong genetic techniques to pharmacogenetics. Um, and so um, people like me, who really know more about pharmaco than they do genomics, um, are, are uh, gradually learning as our genetics and genomics colleagues um, come through and, and teach us uh, a little bit more about how to apply this in, in, in the proper way. The other aspect that I want to briefly uh, touch on um, is that um, the, the, uh, there's been some growth in, in the mouse model systems that really are, are starting to open up uh, the, the mouse as a strong genetic tool. And there, there's always been utility in the, in the mouse, not just in terms of, of knockout and, and uh, trans transgenic, but uh, in, in terms of the, the variability within uh, strains of, of mice. Um, but more recently, the collaborative cross, uh, which you, you may be well familiar with, um, has come forward. Um, initially led by David Threadgill, now by a number of folks at, at UNC um, in, in Chapel Hill, uh, where uh, uh, several um, of the more disparate strains, inbred strains of mice, have been brought together for a massive breeding exercise in which uh, there are now um, almost a, a thousand uh, new unique strains of mice uh, that, that are, are now available um, that uh, are at or greater than the amount of genetic variability seen across the, the human populations uh, ac across the globe. And so instead of having 32 strains of, in, of in, 32 inbred strains uh, of, of mouse in which to do studies, uh, we now have uh, the equivalent of a 1,000 person study in which to be able to do discovery. Uh, these mice are very reproducible because they are inbred and fixed in terms of their, their genetics. Uh, there is um, a, a current effort to um, complete um, the, the, the entire genomes of all these mice. Um, with the, the Sanger as well as, as U.S.-based efforts um, so that these, these mouse strains will have the entire genome uh, 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 laid out for you. Um, you can go in, do your phenotyping, um, and then be able to ask, ask questions. And so, uh, for example, um, one can, can take a, a high-density imaging system uh, in which you can look at various phenotypes, and this is a slide from, from Tim Wiltshire, and it's his uh, fancy graphics, uh, but you can use a uh, high-content imaging system to look at a number of different cellular features. Um, and so in this case, we're looking at the effect of a, of a drug on cell loss, nuclear size, total nuclear intensity, permeability, membrane potential, cytochrome C, a, a number of other measures can be done uh, simultaneously. And therefore, you can take these strains of mice, um, either in this case using the mouse embryonal fibroblast as an in vitro assay, or um, using uh, more, more classical in vivo um, assays um, and, and try to do discovery in that case. And so, for example, we have, we have a, a region of the genome that um, came out from the, the taxanes, uh, docetaxel and paclitaxel, from our CEPH experiment, and a region of the genome uh, from the, the mouse um, embryonal fibroblast uh, experiment that overlaps in terms of centony. Uh, and, and so two independent mammalian systems, both pointing to um, a, a very narrow region of the genome in which there's a, a single gene that had not been implicated um, in the, the activity of this drug, but does have biologic plausibility. 
And so we're now doing the additional experiments to try to nail down whether this gene is indeed a regulator of, of its effect. But the idea of doing discovery in multiple melanin systems in a relatively high throughput manner and try to look at where there's commonality across those systems is really, uh, I think, has a lot of potential in, in terms of, of its discovery. Yeah. Sir. Cell lines and, and mice, li live mice too. But. So in this, in this experiment, sorry, I was going too fast. In this experiment, well, you could make as many as you want. Um, in, in, this, in this case, we, we um, make a, one set of mouse embryonal, fi embryonal fibroblasts from, uh, from these. Yeah. So, so the, um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I know locally we have cell lines that are derived. Um, as I understand it, these mice will be available um, to the community. I mean, this was paid for um, by um, NIH, uh, DOD, and DOE uh, money. Um, and you know, these, these mice, I believe, will be widely available uh, as, a, as a resource uh, from that. Um, we didn't do the vivo experiment for two reasons. One, um, we, many of these phenotypes are hard to measure in, in that, and usually you can only measure one phenotype. Um, secondly, cost. So with these cell lines, we can quickly go through and using 3D4 well plates, uh, very rapidly assay um, all 1,000 cell lines uh, in, a, in a very rapid manner. This data is only showing 32, by the way. I don't want to oversell this particular slide. Um, but one can, can look at a, a large number in a very rapid manner. And so with, with the robotics that we have, and the 3D4 well plating systems, we haven't used 1536, but one certainly could, um, you can scan through 1,000 cell lines in a pretty quick manner. Um, now, you know, when I was a, a, a postdoc, if I had five cell lines to work with, I'd freak out. Um, now we have these technicians who um, just don't know any better. And you know, the, the key thing is to hire someone who doesn't know any better. Uh, because then they think, oh, 1,000 cell lines, well, that, doesn't, that doesn't seem like very many. You know, so. Oh, yes. Y yes. So the nice thing about these these, my, these mouse strains is because of the, the genomics are so um, so well characterized in terms of variance and copy number, um, we can now we now know which cell lines. Um, I'm sorry, which mice we can go back into for those initial experiments. As I'll show you in a couple of slides, we also have large uh, clinical trial cohorts. Um, so if we if we demonstrate this this uh, if we credential this a, a gene to be of, of relevance with our our cell based system. Uh, we can quickly take the variants that are of functional consequence to those studies and then take it into our, our clinical material. So, sorry, say, say the question again. They, they, these are inbred strains. Yes. Well, no, they weren't done quickly. <laughs> the question was how can we make them inbred quickly? And the answer is you cannot make them inbred quickly. Uh, no, they're, they're uh, out at about 25 generations now. No, no, there's no quick way of doing inbred mouse strains. That, nothing's changed there. <laughs> you didn't miss anything. It's still, it's still as slow as, as it always is. It's just that it's been done now. So, so there, there's a lot that can be done in terms of discovery. Those of you that are on the discovery side, um, and maybe you're getting tired of working on disease discovery, come on over to pharmacogenomics. The water's fine. Come on in. Um, we, we need a lot of help. Uh, we have a, a lot of drugs that are out there and a bunch of drugs that are coming into to, uh, development, and we don't have a clue how to use them. Um, and so uh, there's a, a lot of work still to be done um, using even approaches uh, that, that um, are old, tried and true, um, but ho will hopefully uh, uh, help us go, go forward. Now, the, the second issue I wanted to hit on was, was validation in robust data sets. And you know, too often what happens is you do a really cool discovery uh, in, in the laboratory, and then you go to your favorite clinician that you have tea with on Thursdays, and you say, hey, you got any DNA? And, and, they, uh, and they say, oh, yeah, you know, we have 42 samples that we've consented the patient, um, and we have a, a toxicity phenotype. And so you genotype your favorite SNP and your favorite gene in, in all 42 samples, and both heterozygotes had toxicity, and no one else did, um, and therefore everyone should be tested for this gene, the end. And there are steaming piles of literature um, along this same line including some from ourselves, where we've gone and, and done these, these types of experiments. And they were useful early on to demonstrate that one could do these studies, but they are completely useless when it comes to changing practice. Really, the only thing they're useful for um, nowadays 
is uh, to try to expand one's CV and potentially uh, get promotion. It, it, it really has no usefulness at all for helping a, a fellow man. So trying to do the right studies, though, is, is very hard. The reason you do the 42 patient studies, the reason we did the 42 patient studies, is because it was convenient. We had the tumors in the tumor bank. We had the clinical trial uh, uh, sample sitting there. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's actually going to be useful. And so what we've done in the, in the context of the, the NCI um, cooperative groups, mainly the cancer and leukemia group B or CALGB or CALGB, depending how you like to, like to call it, um, is to go in and start integrating blood sampling and when possible tumor sampling into the prospective clinical trials. And so rather than having 46 breast cancer patients from Chapel Hill, uh, we have 4,600 uh, breast cancer patients all on a prospective clinical trial with auditing of the evaluation of toxicity and efficacy, independent imaging evaluation. Uh, the, the, um, these studies were done, uh, are, are being done at o over 200 centers uh, across the U.S. and Canada. Um, and so we have the sort of normal variability in terms of the various centers that you would want in terms of trying to prove something being useful. And you know, having these, these numbers, you know, they're not all large numbers, but having this sort of data um, pro from prospective studies, even if we're doing a retrospective look at the, at the, at the uh, evalu evaluation of the markers, um, allows us to have a much more robust uh, conclusion about whether a marker is likely to be of use or whether it's just a, uh, something that's, that's uh, unique to, to Chapel Hill. We've certainly seen in the past many markers that seem to be uh, relevant um, in, in one particular center, but just do not replicate when you take them out um, uh, uh, across different places. And often, it's a, a protein biomarker, and you'll, well, on further evaluation, what you find out is that that particular investigator only has his clinic on Tuesday mornings, and it's the same lab techs that are running uh, everything, and the same nurses, and there's a level of homogeneity that ends up influencing things in ways that we don't understand but, but um, lead to a lack of replication. And so by having these data sets uh, across uh, uh, the, the, the country, uh, we can hopefully get a, a better conclusion on whether a marker is truly useful or truly useless. And you know, too often, uh, the pharmacogenetic literature has been neither. It, it's been promising. You know, the, the, the biggest cop-out in science is the a paper where the, the last conclusion is, Further research is needed. Complete cop-out. What it means is we didn't do the right study. Now, in some cases, you can't do the right study. The clinical data set's not available, or the mice aren't available, or the cells aren't available. But in, in, uh, in most cases where, where uh, that conclusion is there, um, it's because we, we really didn't do the right study. And so what we're, we're trying to do, and not succeeding in every case, is get into the position where we can do definitive studies that will either put something to rest or cause us to go forward into patient-directed therapy um, using these sort of markers. Um, and so one of the examples I, I have is for a, a, a ovarian cancer study. Um, it's called the, the Scott Rock study. This one was actually conducted in, in Scotland, not in the US. Um, but it's an, an example of a paper we've, we've just uh, uh, are, are sending uh, to a prestigious Boston-based uh, journal. It may not get accepted there, but we'll start there. Um, and in, in this study, uh, what was found is that the, the outcomes, uh, sorry, th this study uh, looked at the, the common therapies for ovarian cancer. Um, car carboplatinum, the platinum agent, was common uh, to both, both arms. And then one of the taxane twins, either docetaxel or paclitaxel, uh, were used. And so these drugs are, are very similar to each other, um, and both have, have activity in ovarian cancer. But the question was, are, are these different? And the, the bottom line was, clinically, they're, they're not different. Their, their outcomes in terms of progression-free survival or overall survival were, were not statistically different. The toxicity profiles were, were pretty similar. There was a slight difference in toxicity profile. Now, so what one can then do, sorry, but the, the main toxicity that was seen in both arms was toxicity to the nerves, peripheral neuropathy. As I mentioned to you before, um, many of the platinum-containing regimens uh, will cause a, a, a peripheral neuropathy. Um, and it's a big deal. It's, it's, um, it affects patients' quality of life quite dramatically. Any of you who have ever um, been to an ovarian cancer clinic or have had a, a uh, friend or loved one with ovarian cancer uh, and have, have been there, you'll see a number of, of women uh, with walkers. 
and these aren't necessarily old women, but they're, they're using a walker to try to get around. The reason why is that the drugs have fried their nerves. They can't even walk normally uh, because of these drugs. And it might be controlling their disease, but it's also really uh, affecting their nerves in a negative way. And so we wanted to ask a question of why. What, what, can we predict this in a, in a better manner? And there really was, really was not known. So we did, a, at that point, a, a custom chip, taking genes involved with nerve function, uh, and yeah, genes involved with nerve function, genes involved with inherited neuropathies, realizing that the, the variants found in Charcot-Marie Tooth or whatever uh, will not be the, those variants because those are extremely rare. But maybe some more common variants might have some functional consequence. Um, and then uh, genes involved in the, the uh, known to be involved with the pharmacology of these drugs, realizing the, the caveats that I, that I uh, said earlier when I was ri ridiculing uh, my lack of knowledge about uh, uh, drugs. Um, and so looking at these, these variants, using, in this case, an Illuma uh, Golden Gate uh, SNP assay, uh, to try to look at uh, predictors of neurotoxicity in this patient population. And so we started off, out of the 1536 uh, SNPs that were available, there were um, uh, 1,261 that may, met our quality assessment. Uh, many of them fell out because they were, they were monomorphic. Um, there were some of them that were, at, were um, too far out of Heidi, Hardy Weinberg to be believable. Um, there were others where there were um, control issues uh, in terms of the, the, um, the, the genotypes. So of these um, 1,261 SNPs, we initially looked at a cohort of, of 500 patients, um, and there were 69 that came out to be positive after multiple, comp uh, multiple, um, uh, uh, correction, multiple comparison correction um, that for, for this initial cohort. We then took these 69 SNPs into a second cohort of 500 women um, on this same therapy. And there were five of them, uh, five SNPs, that um, were still statistically significant after uh, multiple comparison correction. Four of these that were in a consistent direction. So there was one of them that was a positive predictor in the first data set and a negative predictor in the second data set. Um, and two wrongs do not make a right. Um, that, that, uh, that variant got, got tossed out. So we ended up with four variants um, that, that, um, that looked of interest. And um, when you look at these genes, their variants in you know, BCL2 or some of the other, uh, uh, you know, that, that gene you can kind of make a story in terms of cell death. Some of these other genes, are, are, there's not an obvious story um, except for their involvement in, in nerve function or in peripheral neuropathy syndromes. But the odds ratios for each of these were between uh, 2.2 and 4. So the type of odds ratios that you'd pay, to, pay attention to clinically, you know, none of these odds ratios of 1.15 that we don't have a clue what to do with. Um, but odds ratios that you would actually care about um, in, in terms of individual markers. When you look at the population attributable risk, when you put them all together, um, it had a, almost 85% population attributable risk. So a very substantial amount of, of uh, risk um, for in, in terms of a, a potential clinical utility. And then when we do the, the simple thing that people do these days, when you basically make a score where you add up the number of bad variants that a, a person has, um, in, in this case, it went from, from uh, zero to, to four, um, and this is a, showing a mapping of the odds ratio. Um, I realize there's a, a very steep rise here. The curve makes it look much smoother, um, but that's what our statistician gave us. Um, but um, there was a, 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 an additive, or in this case, a super additive effect, uh, depending on no, the number of variants you had uh, associating with the risk of peripheral neuropathy, um, such that the folks with four of these variants had an odds ratio of, of um, of over 40 um, in this particular study uh, in terms of their risk of having peripheral neuropathy. We also asked the question, do these risk scores associate with outcomes? So the old teaching for, for cancer chemotherapy was that you needed to nearly kill the patient in order to kill the tumor. And back when the drugs were um, intense cytotoxics, nitrogen mustards, et cetera, that was probably true. In, in modern therapy, that is not true. There's uh, uh, study after study demonstrating that uh, severity of toxicity has no relationship with the degree of, of efficacy uh, for whether it's a kinase inhibitor um, or one of the, uh, the, the cytotoxics such as was used here. And so we asked that, but still we wanted to ask that question. And what we saw was there was no relationship between their, their uh, uh, neuropathy score um, with, with these genes and either uh, their uh, progression-free survival or their overall survival in this study. And so what we ended up with was four SNPs in four genes that validated in a separate 500 patient cohort um, with biology that we would not have associated directly with these drugs, 
the markers were associated with risk of peripheral neuropathy, but not with uh, the, the um, survival or efficacy outcome measurement. And so we now have an opportunity to both try to prospectively see whether these markers do predict neuropathy, and that study is, is ongoing, as well as take these genes um, and put them through a screen for inhibitors. And so we have one of the NIGMS um, screening centers at, at UNC, and so they are screening a, a large uh, uh, library of compounds against these genes. They're actually not doing BCL2, that one's been kind of done to death, but using like, the other three genes, trying to identify inhibitors to um, see whether they might be potential adjuvants uh, to be used with this chemotherapy. Because based on this data, the degree of neuropathy and the efficacy are not linked. And so in theory, we can inhibit the neuropathy without influencing the efficacy. At least there's the promise of that being true. Um, and it would be a great day if we were able to minimize uh, the, the, uh, the neuropathy because it is so debilitating to these patients. You know, often we're not trying to cure these women. We're trying to give them a better quality of life for the time they have left on this earth. And to uh, screw up their nerves so they can't play the piano, or they can't button their blouse, or they can't hold their grandkid um, is, is really um, not, uh, not our goal. And so hopefully genetics, this sort of data, will lead us towards um, some approaches where we can at the least know that we're going to get into trouble early, at the best um, have some uh, interventions uh, that, can, that can make things uh, e even better. The, the last piece on in terms of, of uh, robust data sets is we're using these data sets now um, initially for genome-wide association studies, and we've completed four um, genome-wide association studies um, uh, to date. Uh, the first one was uh, in uh, a pancreas cancer study. Uh, that paper has just been submitted to um, the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Um, we're uh, looking at genetic predictors of both outcome um, as well as um, toxicity to the drugs, neutropenia, as well as the hypertension that you get from uh, some of the vascular endothelial growth factor uh, uh, antagonists. We, we have uh, two genome-wide studies in this, in this area, one for neuropathy, one for neutropenia, um, and then uh, we have a genome-wide study that's just been completed in prostate cancer uh, that we're, we're um, now starting the analysis on. And uh, if, um, depending whether uh, uh, Francis smiles our way with the most recent uh, director's um, uh, grant that was submitted on the 15th of, of March, uh, we have a next-gen proposal in this same data set uh, to go in and, and use some of the next-generation sequencing, or in this case, a whole, whole exome approach, um, to, to try to do discovery in the context of a, a prospective clinical trial, which is something that has not been done, uh, at least in the, on the cancer side of things, uh, to, to date. So we, we are starting, we're slow. We're, you know, the disease, you know, there's, you go to the NHGRI website, you can see, you know, hundreds of, of GWASs for disease, very few on the drug side, and partly because we didn't have the data sets in which to go in and do discovery. You know, in clinical pharmacology, 50 patients is a huge study. In GWAS, it's not even worth doing it with 50 patients. So we're now getting to the point where we have the numbers where it's, it's worth trying to do a GWAS, um, and, and, uh, and, and we'll see what we get in terms of new discovery. I know on the neuropathy and, um, and neutropenia side for this study, we are finding genes uh, that um, we, we would not expect um, in, in, uh, to come forward. Um, unfortunately, one of the genes that looks interesting for um, neutropenia um, is, associ is associated, unfortunately, with a syndrome called McLeod syndrome. Um, and that has been uh, the source of, of uh, terrible ridicule um, by my colleagues as they make fun of me and my, uh, my disease uh, that uh, I, I didn't even know about until now. Um, and so this, this sort of area is, is certainly one area we're trying to do uh, discovery in the context of this sort of, of data set. So the, the last piece is, is really um, about applying the, this sort of work. And you know, too often we find something cool in the laboratory, we maybe do a local assessment of whether this biomarker is going to work. We, we even do a, a large validation study. And the next step is nothing. Oh, sure, we published a study in New England Journal of Medicine, and we get a uh, NIH grant, and we get a free trip to Bethesda. Um, but w w what do we really do with these studies? You know, a, a couple years ago, um, my, my um, mother was on the, the internet, hopefully looking for recipes or something, um, and um, she came across some PDFs of, of some of my scientific papers. And so she pulled them down, and she sent them to my 97-year-old grandmother. And my grandmother lives in a uh, assisted living facility, 
where a few years ago they had a bunch of 14-year-olds come in and teach the inhabitants uh, how to use computers and learn some of the lingo and stuff. And she's not blogging or anything, don't get me wrong, but, but you know, she's able to you know, actually do some stuff and, and pretty good, better than my parents. You know, and so, um, she, so she sent, them to my, my, uh, sent the, the papers to my grandmother. And um, so I was talking to her and she said, oh, your mother sent me some of your magazines. Like, oh, no. But it turned out it was the science stuff, so it was, it was okay. Um, um, so so um, I said, well, what did you think, Grandma? Well, my grandmother has a third grade education. She's, a, you know, she's an active lady, but not a real savvy science type. Um, and uh, I said, what did you think, Grandma? And um, she said, um, um, beautiful font. <laughs> that, that was, and I was impressed she knew the word font. But that, that was all it did for her. It did, it did nothing for her. I mean, she was happy to see my name on there and everything, but it, it did nothing for her. So are we doing the kind of science that is going to help her grandson uh, get promoted and do lots of cool things, or are we doing the kind of science that's going to help grandma? And too often, uh, we're doing uh, stuff that has uh, no handoff. You know, if you look at, at industries, when, they, when, when there's a group that's doing engineering for some part of a car, they have a plan for when they're done, handing it off to the next people who are going to do the next part and to go on the next part and the next part. In science, often our plan is osmosis. We do our science and we publish it out there and we pray that someone will accidentally come across it and think that, hey, maybe they can use it in their area. We have no plan at all for, for a handoff of where it's going forward. And we, you know, we need to have that. And what's one of the things we're trying to build with my, my institute was pulling together all these people to have a handoff. And I'm not saying we're succeeding, but um, you know, it's really something that, that we, we need to be doing as a country um, is making sure that some of the phenomenal basic science and fundamental science is, is fast-tracked forward. Um, and the reason it's not now is mainly because um, the groups in the various sectors don't interact, don't see each other, and don't read the same journals. And so it's no surprise that there's amazing things tucked away um, that um, are, are not helping people um, because we didn't plan for them to help someone. So do... Well, no, I, I, yeah, well, I think that there, I mean, there, certainly we are, we are helping people, but um, too often it's on accident where, we, you know, we, we know this problem. So, you know, part of what we need to do is, you know, we're, we work very much forward, you know, do a basic discovery and then build on that, make it more translational, go forward. Too often we don't work backwards at all. And, and yeah, oh, yeah. Everybody in this room knows that there's been progress made, and, and I certainly don't want you to give them away saying that uh, we're all a bunch of losers and should go down to Burger King and apply for a job. Um, uh, they do get, give you fries with that. But, um, um, but rather, um, I think that we can do better um, in, by, by planning our science in a more careful way. And those of you that are focusing in an individual area, I don't mean that you should change and become something else. Please keep doing what you're doing, but just remember there's a handoff. Um, and having that handoff, you know, and when you, when you drop a baton in a relay race, you're the idiot, and you get kicked, and, and uh, um, it, you know, we drop the baton a, a lot in, in science um, because we, we don't plan for the handoff. So doing biomarker-driven studies uh, in, in this context um, is, is often not the step. You know, there's been a lot of New England Journal papers that have had nothing done um, after that because the investigators thought that they succeeded. That was the goal. Um, and, and nothing uh, done further. And so um, one example where we're trying to take this forward um, is in the, in the breast cancer drug tamoxifen. And most of you are familiar with, with uh, tamoxifen. It's a drug that's in the news quite a lot. Um, back when I trained, uh, life was a, it was a simpler time. Um, tamoxifen, which is a partial antagonist of estrogen, uh, was converted by a number of different enzymes to 4-hydroxytamoxifen, which is a, a potent antagonist of the receptor. Um, of estrogen receptor, um, and that was it. That was, that was how the drug worked. And a couple years ago, um, an oncologist named Vered Stearns over at Georgetown University uh, and her colleague David Flockhart, a clinical pharmacologist uh, who was there at the, at the time, Vered had a, a patient with breast cancer who was taking tamoxifen, was getting the, the hot flashes, the perimenopausal syndrome that you get from this drug, um, and that's expected and normal. Um, but she also had uh, clinical depression. And so was treated with one of the um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, uh, for, for her depression. And within a week, the hot flashes went away. Now, if it had been me, I would have been jumping for joy. 
anybody with Scottish blood loves two for the price of one. And so hot flashes go away, and the depression will eventually go away, two for the price of one. Got to love it. Well, Vered's a very smart person. What she did is she realized, she said, wait a minute, that's wrong. That, that, the hot flashes went away so quickly, this, there's something different going on. And so an, pushed it and analyzed it further. And what she identified is that there's a metabolite um, co now called endoxifen uh, that is formed. It's predominantly formed on this pathway here where there is some redundancy on the first step, but then P452D6 is the second step. Most of the, the antidepressants that were used at the time are inhibitors of this enzyme. And so what was happening was that the, the antidepressant, yeah, it was making the hot flashes go away, but it was making them go away because it was neutralizing the drug. There was no active metabolite being formed. And so your hot flashes can go away if you don't take the drug, but you also get no clinical benefit. Um, and, and so this sort of data um, led to a, a dramatic change um, in which antidepressants are used in breast cancer patients. And there are some, in the vaccine in particular, that, does, that do not inhibit this enzyme and therefore have become the drug of choice uh, because of, of that data. Well, as many of you know, um, somewhere between uh, uh, 5 and 10% of the people in this room um, are, are deficient for this enzyme. You either have a deletion or a, a um, non-synonymous SNP um, in, in this gene that, that causes uh, you to not have any function uh, of, this, of this gene. And you, you probably don't know it because it doesn't cause any outward effect. The ones of you that do know it um, have, have done a phenotyping assay. And that is you went to the dentist, you had some dental pain, he gave you Tylenol with codeine, you took it and it didn't help you at all. And you went back to the dentist and he told you you were a wimp. Well, 5 to 10% of you have a genetic reason why you're a wimp. The rest of you are just wimps. The, the, uh, the 5 to 10 percent cannot activate codeine to its active metabolite, cannot activate oxycodone to its active metabolite, and in, cannot activate tamoxifen in, in this case. It's the same gene uh, for, for that case. And so um, the studies have been done to look at the genetic variation, and what's shown on this axis here, the y-axis, is the concentration of active metabolite. And there's a stepwise relationship between whether the person has two normal copies, one normal copy, or no normal copies, so-called poor metabolizers, um, of, of this gene. Now, there's variability within each of these. So this is not the only c contributor to, to uh, th this gene's function. But it does influence this gene's function. What's shown on the right-hand side are people with two normal copies or one normal copy, but are on one of the inhibitors. And so it's reminding you that drug interactions can cause a similar effect um, to a, uh, an intermediate or, or so to a heterozygous or a homozygous um, variant uh, genetic condition. And so either drug interactions or genetics can both influence the, the active metabolite levels in this particular case. Now, there have been a, a large number of studies um, that have shown an association between the, the genotype of CYP2D6 and recurrence of breast cancer uh, with, in patients on tamoxifen. There have also been three studies, two from, from the same group in Sweden, one from Arkansas, uh, that did not find an association uh, with tamoxifen. Now, you can try to explain back and forth between these. Um, there's differences in how many variants they looked at, because there are um, over 75 different variants in this gene if, wanted to be, wanted to be if one wanted to be complete. Um, also, most of these studies here are larger and have um, patients that are just on tamoxifen, whereas some of the studies here have adjuvant chemotherapy also mixed in. Uh, but we've got to the point where it's really beyond um, a publication bias. Um, in terms of uh, the, the, the relationship. And these are the sorts of curves one sees. This happens to be from one of the initial studies um, where the folks with a poor metabolizer genotype have a, a very poor outcome, uh, relatively speaking. Intermediates have uh, an inferior outcome, but, but uh, uh, not quite as dramatically different. And then the extensive metabolizers um, have, uh, have, have uh, this outcome shown here. Now, what this shows you is that the genotype does influence outcome at some level. But even in the good group, the green group here, there's still patients having recurrence of their breast cancer. And that could be tumor biology, it could be some other germline effect, but there's never going to be one genetic solution to a complex um, problem. And so you know, one shouldn't expect there to be one, one gene or, or, or such uh, that's gonna be the answer to this. It's a complex disease, it's gonna have a complex select, selection of solutions. 
but we do see this sort of effect. Now, some of the, um, some of the uh, insurance companies um, are, have now picked up on this and are starting to offer testing, in, in many cases, offering testing for free. So, you know, Medco Health Solutions um, has worked with the various companies that they, they represent, um, and they, they're a, a, a drug benefits uh, management company, um, and, and they now offer testing for tamoxifen and also for warfarin and, and for clopidogrel um, for free. So it completely takes out the, the occasion of uh, the, the discussion about is it worth the cost of the testing because they've factored it into their relationship with IBM and General Motors and the other, other uh, companies that they represent. And so that's, every patient who gets a prescription for any of those drugs immediately, um, literally immediately in the in electronic sense, um, gets offered a genetic test. If they're willing for it, their prescriber is offered the, uh, the test, and then they have clinical support staff that help them through that. But you could see how this sort of thing could be used also for evil. So you identify the people who are going to not benefit from tamoxifen, and you offer them an alternate therapy. Okay, that seems like a noble thing. But tamoxifen is much cheaper than the alternate therapy. So you could also see a situation where you go and you assay all the people on the alternate therapy, and only the 5 to 7% that will not benefit from tamoxifen will you leave on that therapy. All, the other 95%, you say, well, you can stay on that therapy if you want to pay for it, but we will only pay for your tamoxifen. Now, tamoxifen is not a bad drug. It's saved more women's lives than any other therapy that's, that's out there. But um, that, that patient and, and clinician autonomy uh, will now be put into question uh, because of this sort of, of relationship. And so there are ethical issues and, and legal and, and social issues to try to work through in terms of, of how this is implemented in a way that um, is good for patients um, but not driven solely by, by cost savings and issues like that. The other thing is uh, for those people who had the especially bad outcome, they need a different therapy. For these folks here, what do we do? Now, the few of you that are interested in oncology might know that tamoxifen is normally given as a 20 milligram dose in this country, but is, a, is FDA approved from 10 to 40 milligrams. And so the most common call we were getting from community oncologists is, what do we do with these women? This is like 40% of the population. What do we do? They know what to do here. They know what to do here. They don't have a clue what to do with these 40%. And so we initiated a very simple study where we took patients that had been on tamoxifen for, for at least four months. We measured active metabolite levels, and we see a statistical difference. We, I don't have the, uh, the proper version yet because our statisticians don't like to generate pretty graphics, but so this is a cartoon version of that. Um, but the active metabolite levels are um, significantly different between those that are extensive metabolizers and those that are intermediate metabolizers. So these folks have differences in their active metabolite levels um, in, in, uh, in, in our, our local um, study. The initial study was 120 patients. We're now finishing up a 500 patient study for this, the same finding. So we wanted to ask the question, if we leave these people, the green people, on, uh, on their 20 milligram dose, are they still having similar blood levels? And they do. There's no statistical difference between the start of our study and four and uh, so that should be uh, four months later um, for, for this case. We then took the patients who have the low blood levels, the, which we took the patients who are genetically heterozygous. We didn't measure their blood levels in real time. And we doubled their dose, gave them the 40 milligram dose. So it's nothing sexy, no kinase inhibitor or anything like that. We just took a, the same old boring drug and we gave them double the dose. Still an FDA-approved dose, but double the dose. And what we found uh, was we're able to normalize the blood levels. They went from a statistical difference here to no statistical difference here. Um, and there's a, a, a dramatic increase in, in terms of looking within each patient. And so by doing something as simple and boring as doubling the dose, we're now able to completely normalize blood level. Now, as I showed you from the, this, this slide here, even with um, equivalent... Uh, even with the extensive metabolizer genotype, and therefore, um, the, in this case, the higher blood levels, as we've shown, you still have patients who have recurrence. So we're not curing everyone, but we, we believe that we've closed this gap. At least at the pharmacokinetic level, we've closed this gap. We now have to do the further studies in terms of outcomes. But we've been able to demonstrate um, that by doing something simple that can be done at any practice across the U.S., um, and it, using an already FDA-approved dose, um, one can take uh, this biomarker, 
um, in terms of metabolites and, and, and normalize it for what is functionally 95% of the women on breast cancer, with breast cancer. So this sort of, of story um, needs now to go on to the survival type data, but using a short-term biomarker, able to show that genetics can cause this sort of effect. Now, the ideal is we get to a point where we can have toxicity evaluation, disease evaluation, infection risk, supportive care, have all done prior to ever prescribing a drug. And that day may come at some point in time, but it's still a, a, a ways off. Especially, um, it's especially a ways off if we look at, from a global standpoint. If we look around the world, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of countries that have an a, a intact health system, but don't have the money to do genotyping um, in, in every single patient. And so the, the, very, the last few minutes, um, uh, I'm going to mention briefly some of our global health efforts, where we've tried to make the genome useful uh, to the developing world. And you know, with the human genome, prom genome promise, um, there's um, you know, lots of, of, uh, of, of things that it was supposed to do in terms of, of better diagnosis and better selection of therapy. Um, and genome type guided therapy is now starting to happen in, in rich countries, uh, mainly in the West. But what about the rest of the world? You know, that there, there seem to be always 30 years behind, and that gap never closes. And so we tried to came up, come up with a way to make the genome useful now um, to the rest of the world. You know, the genome, when you, when you talk to the develop folks in many developing countries, the, the genome is completely a Western toy. The Human Genome uh, Project has been um, just as use, useless to them as, uh, as the, your favorite Disney princess. I mean, it's, it's really something that is, is meaningless because they, they know it'll be 30 years before they can, they can use it. And so we, we've tried to, to move forward and say, well, if we can't do individual patient genotyping, can we do something that, that's useful? So the best option is that each person understands their makeup, genetically and otherwise, and then makes decisions on their therapy based on that. That's the ideal. The worst situation is that you infer uh, uh, data from one population onto the rest of the world. And that's what we do now. Most of the world uses either the EMEA, the, the European Medicines Agency, um, or the FDA um, safety uh, data for, for their starting point for their drugs. Uh, they either can't afford or, or just don't want to do separate studies there. And so what happens is that most of the initial studies in, in, the, US, in the US and uh, most initial studies with, uh, with new drugs are conducted either in the US or in Western Europe even the Eastern Europe studies um, are, are, um, are, are, that are being done now um, still represent a, a very white population. So phase one studies, where a lot of the initial dosing done, is in 18 to 40-year-old white males. Oh, sure, there's a few people that are not white. But over 80%, based on our FDA analysis, um, are white. They may now be whites from Ukraine instead of whites from Australia or, or uh, North Carolina. Um, but they're, they're still not very representative of the world population. And so it's no surprise that when drugs get into the rest of the world, they find differences in terms of the toxicity profile, both the incidence and the types of toxicity, the dosing that, it, that is needed um, as they go forward. And so an intermediate step is to try to understand the, the genetic risks of toxicity and efficacy um, in individual populations within a country. And so very much going on the Voltaire, the best is the enemy of good. The best is the ultimate goal. Perfection is our ultimate goal. And in this case, it's being able to look at the individual patient in every person that needs, needs therapy. But in the meantime, we can still do good. And too often, we wait for perfection and therefore don't do good. <laughs> That's not very good English, but you know what I mean. Um, and, and so um, can we do something now while we're waiting to, uh, to do the ideal? And so we've taken the WHO essential medicines list. I've done a lot of work on identifying of these 206 systemic drugs, what genes influence the metabolism, transport, or our targets for these, these drugs, and looking at the variants that, that influence uh, these drugs. And we don't mean variants that are non-synonymous. We mean, and we don't mean variants that cause a change in blood levels. We mean variants that have been shown in at least two populations to cause a change, at least a doubling, of the risk of toxicity or altered efficacy um, in real intact people. And right now in the US, 
you have to have some pretty amazing studies. We're always talking about we need prospective randomized trials to uh, change which therapy you might give an individual person. But if you're buying drugs for a national formulary, the, the national drug menu for, for a country, if you have two equal therapies, if you have two drugs that are equally effective, have equal cost, equal accessibility, all you need is a feather of data to shift one versus the other. You don't need to have a, a huge amount of data because you have to choose one of these. You know, in this country, if you don't like the drug that um, is on your formulary for your insurance company, you fill out a little form, you get it signed by your doctor, and usually you can get a, a waiver so you can use some other therapy. In most of the world, they have one set of drugs for the treatment of most diseases. And if you want anything else, well, you can go fly to Switzerland because there are no other choices. It's a high stakes deal uh, about which drugs are available because they can only afford one or two options for each common disease. And so by using this data, one can then try to make these choices. So as an example, the thiopurines um, are, on, are on this list for pharmacogenetics. Um, the, these drugs are used for rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, some dermatologic disorders. Um, they're also used for the treatment of childhood uh, leukemia. And so if you look at the, the genome, uh, there are variants in the thiopurine methyltransferase gene that are associated with severe neutropenia, in some cases fatal neutropenia. Um, in, uh, and, and these are the main variants that have been shown across the world to be important. And it, depending on what, what genotype status you are, there's different dosing requirements um, that are already well known. And so one can take that data, and, and certainly here in this country, we use that data to, to try to identify risk and to, to adjust the dose of, of the drugs. Now, we've created these world maps, and so let me walk you through them very briefly. Um, if you see gray, that means there's no data. Uh, if you see green, that means the data is very similar to the U.S. white population. And uh, I picked the U.S. white population not because I'm a U.S. white, uh, but because that's where drugs are developed. And we don't have to like it, but that's the current state of affairs. Um, uh, light blue means the risk is one half or less. Yellow means the risk is double or more. And so if we take a country like Ghana, which uh, we started working in back in, in 1994, um, and, and look at the frequency of the variants for, for this gene, um, they, they have, um, it's over 10% of the population have a high risk variant um, for, for uh, severe toxicity from these drugs. And that's been backed up by a high risk, high incidence of toxicity um, in the, the pharmacovigilance studies that they've done. So one can go in and look at the, the, the data and looking across the, the most common tribes within, uh, within Ghana, um, you can see that they're, they're all pretty much the same. I mean, the, I mean, the fonte are a little bit higher, but really there's no statistical difference among these, these particular groups within the country. But what's shown here on, on this, this slide is the Yoruban population from the HAP map. Now, if you're geographically inclined, you'll know there's Ghana, and then there's Togo and Benin, two little tiny countries, and there's Nigeria in, in West Africa. The both former English colonies, um, a lot of similarities. Um, Ghana has a much better soccer team. Uh, if any of you are from Nigeria, I'm sorry, but Ghana just, you know, the, the black stars rule. Um, but if you look at the, you know, so you'd expect that they'd be the same. As a matter of fact, the Yorubans have been pitched as the West African population for the HapMap project. Well, for this particular clinically um, actionable genotype, the frequency in, in the Yoruban population is one half that scene in nearby Ghana. And the Yorubans are identical in frequency to the US and UK Caucasians. So when we're talking, talking about these population differences and wondering why we would need to look at each country and we, each group within the country, um, this side, type of data, where you're talking about a, a clinically actionable variant, when you start looking at that level of resolution, there are dramatic differences, in this case a doubling of the incidence, between countries that you'd expect to be identical. Um, and so this sort of information um, is, is uh, we're using as we, we pull this forward. So we have data on, on the surveillance of patients, where you go in and you'd, if there's a heightened risk, you would monitor patients more carefully. So something like isoniazid for, for tuberculosis, if you have a heightened risk of liver toxicity based on your genetics, you're not gonna stop using isoniazid. It's too important for tuberculosis. And so you'd monitor the patients more often. So we have several programs where we're monitoring patients every six months, sorry, every three months instead of every six months um, using cheap little dipstick uh, type evaluations that are affordable in those countries. You also can prioritize available therapies. So if we're looking at malaria, 
Um, the, the WHO has four different drug sets that they propose as being any of these four are the right ones for, for malaria. In many countries, these two have too much resistance and so are not used. And so you're really stuck with these two on the, on the outside. And if you look at amodiaquin, one of these, these particular drugs, um, it's metabolized by a P450 to this metabolite. Now, either the parent or the metabolite are equally effective. So metabolism doesn't influence efficacy at all. But if you have a genetic variant in, in the metabolism, you have more active drug, that sorry, more parent drug that shifts down to form this toxic metabolite. And so genetic variation influences the amount of toxicity that's seen um, in, in these, these different populations. This was initially found in, in Zanzibar um, off of uh, uh, the coast of, of uh, Tanzania when they were, were using uh, th this therapy. Um, and so when you look at the incidence of the variant um, in Zanzibar, it's 2%. Now, those of you that do population genetics, if you have a 2% of the population being at heightened risk, I bet you you don't even care. You completely blow it off. Because, I, mean, I mean, it's so rare. I mean, who cares? Well, if you then put in the burden of disease, 2% of the Zanzibar population will get severe hepatotoxicity from this drug. That equals 30,000 people per year on one tiny island. So the burden of disease combined with the level of incidence, suddenly heightens the, the, the your, your care. So if I came to you and said, you could uh, identify 30,000 people who are going to get severe liver toxicity from this anti-malarial, you'd care. And so bringing in the burden of disease along with the genetic variant is, is really important. If you go to Bolivia, almost double the frequency of this variant, but very little malaria. Only 64 people per year are going to get harmed by this drug. Go to Malaysia, half the frequency, a fair amount of malaria, about 8,000 patients. So bringing in this sort of data allows us to work with the ministries of health and, and help guide them which, on which therapy one can look at. And so we don't blink at all when we look at HIV virus or malaria or TB in terms of sensitivity of the bug, but we also have to look at the patients and their germline, the host genome, in terms of making these decisions. And that's been completely neglected with the current global health um, uh, plans, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to, to push this forward. So in conclusion, um, we are getting pretty good at discovering things, and we discover something, and we look at the outcome, and we feel pretty good about it, except there's a lot more that needs to be done uh, before things can become routine practice. And so as you're going forward, I, I would encourage you to start thinking about who are the other people that need to get involved. You do not want to become a clinical pathologist or a medical informaticist, or a health systems integrator, whatever that is, and you certainly don't want to become a health economist. Um, but they may be the, the key to your science help, helping someone. And so planning the types of teams that can really drive this forward into routine practice are key. And until we do that, we're going to create great science that will eventually help someone, but not at the pace that it could. So the Pharmacogenetic Research Network gives us a bunch of cash to do the studies uh, that we do, and we thank them for it. Um, and then my local institute pulls together the various types of people uh, that help us to, to uh, do this work. And I'll, I'll stop right there. Thank you very much. Can you use the uh, aisle microphones for the questions, please? Where, where is the microphone? Oh, it's up there. Oh, thank you. Okay, okay. Here, here is a question. I think it's a nice idea. I'm talking about global health issues which you have raised. It is clear this is a very large effort and we are, as you pointed out, we are just beginning in this effort. Yes. What is your estimation? How many more years, 50, 100, 200 years, will we take when we reach the level of sophistication which you want to achieve? So, so the, the, it's hard to predict because the changes that have happened over the last year uh, happened much faster than I would have anticipated. Okay. Um, so with the, with the with companies that are developing new drugs now having large data sets with genetic information and actually doing something with those data sets, it's really changed the game. 
With the NIH now having genetics uh, blood sampling as part of their clinical trials infrastructure um, and enforcing it in many cases, uh, it is, is changing the game. So now that we have data sets for many of the large, uh, the, the, the therapeutic areas that are large enough to actually draw a conclusion, mm -hmm. um, I, I now think that we're, we're looking at uh, probably a 15-year horizon before half of the drugs that are prescribed will have clear data. I don't think we'll ever get to the point where all drugs that are prescribed will have this data, partly because there's many drugs that are so safe that they don't need it. They don't need to be individualized. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the ones that are being focused on now are either unsafe in a substantial amount of the population, are super expensive, such as some of the rheumatoid arthritis drugs, or both. Um, and so we're, we're seeing that sort, of, uh, that sort of emphasis. And so you know, therapeutic areas that I never thought would have markers um, now have some really nice data. Interferon for hepatitis. Mm -hmm. there, I would have bet you good money that we would never have a marker for who's predicting, for predicting who's going to respond to interferon. We do. Mm -hmm. We have a marker that has been shown in multiple populations now. The ribavirin data that just came out in, in science. Um, really, drugs that I thought were so far down the list, we'd never have any data. And here we go. So I have um, become cautiously optimistic now that um, we're starting to see some real traction with drugs that we actually care about. Yeah, it's, it's good to hear that. Thank you. Another, another question. So in thinking about the chemotherapy and the neurotoxicity associated with it, another thing, way of approaching the mechanism would be more at the cellular level. So if people looked at like demyelination or anything like that, they exploring those possibilities. Is it directly on the nerves or the, on, the, on the Schwann cells? It, have anybody used, looked at that level? It, it, um, they, they have, uh, mainly in, in, um, in rats to date. Sure. Um, obviously in humans, it's models. It's definitely yeah. to do there. Yeah. Um, and the um, dorsal root ganglion is, is, seems to be the, a major site for toxicity. Uh -huh. and, and so you know, we have a follow-up study in the collaborative cross uh, with all these mouse strains to try to, uh, to, try to look at that. Um, you know, the, poor, um, the, the poor technician has to dig all those uh, dorsal root ganglia out of, uh, out of each mouse as a needs a, a, a metal, but um, we're going to try to look and see, you know, are there genetic predictors of who's getting toxicity at that local site? Because um, you're right, there's so many different factors that could yeah, be influencing, but it, it appears that that's where the toxicity is occurring, rather than um, myelination issues or central issues. Yeah, because if memory serves me correctly, I think SOX-10 is a marker for neural crest development. And you picked that up in your screens. So right. And so you we... You go further with that, too. Yes. Yeah, and so we have... Um, so we've been, uh, actually, maybe you're even the one we got them from. There, there is a, um, there's collaborators that have given us um, uh, n knockout mice for each of those four. Yeah, sure. And, and we're working through, including someone here at the NIH. Uh -huh. um, and I'm not doing those mouse experiments, but, um, and so we're looking in the mouse to see if we can replicate this, um, and then are taken into the collaborative cross. So we have the knockout mice, and then we have the, the inbred strains as well. Thanks. It was a great talk. We love it. Thank you. Um, so there's a, the question was, is there a good review article for the uh, for markers on drugs? There, there are, there are a few out there. There, there's not a lot. There's not one within the last six months that I can think of that is especially good. Um, would is there a, a website for this? Like if I sent you some some, let me go pull the actual citing uh, for a couple of those and put it up on the on the website. Um, yeah. The, the last, um, so you know, New England had a review, but, but that's not, that, you know, it was 2003 when they last had that review. It's, 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 it's far out of date. Um, there's a couple from 2008 uh, that are pretty good. A lot of them are, are very specific. So there's, an, there's, you know, there's some, a great review on tamoxifen pharmacogenetics. Well, that's great, but you know, what about everything else? Yeah, so. um, just want, I probably don't need this, but um, for your study in Ghana versus in the Yoruban versus Ghanaian uh, ethnic groups, what were your sample sizes? Because they probably weren't as big as the ones here at NIH that you're pointing out. Well, in, in Ghana, um, each tribe had uh, 500 individuals. Um, so it ended up being 2,500 um, people for the Ghanaian data. The Yoruban data was the HapMap data. So that was much smaller. That's only um, uh, 30 trios, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, for, for, for that. So that's, and that, and, you know, that could be influencing it. Certainly the Yorubans, you know, those, those individuals don't even re necessarily represent all Yorubans, much less, and they certainly don't represent all Nigerians. Uh, yeah. So it, it could be, 
from, from the GANA standpoint, we have good numbers, uh, but from, um, we, we use 500 for each population um, based on our, uh, we want to be able, so our statisticians went through and asked the question, how big a sample size do we need to be able to detect some of the rarer variants with at least a doubling of incidence? And so that's why we're doing 500 per, per population. And you would see that much variation more in Africa than elsewhere. Um, we see it. Uh, we see it all over the place. Okay. Um, and so I, I don't know if you you probably noticed on that particular slide there was you know there was very high incidence in Bulgaria, high incidence in Peru. Uh, we don't have a clue why, and probably we never will have a clue why. Uh, but certain populations just seem to have um, these. Even populations that, if you looked at a million SNP chip, would be nearly identical. Hmm. When you look at the, because we're talking about an individual decision based on one or very small number of variants. And so it, you know, all of the data that helps someone be similar just goes away. So would the Pharmaco chip that's been developed help with that kind of study? Is that what yeah, you're Yes, so, so we currently use the, the Affymetrix DMET Plus chip, uh, which um, has more of the variants that, that we need than some of the other products that are out there. Um, we need to supplement it for the HLA markers and for some of the pharmacodynamic uh, genes that, that are on there. Can I ask you a quick opinion? Uh, we uh, we are having a debate uh, in, in our circle about the utility of HapMap cell panel, lympho lymphoblastoid cell panel. Now, is that panel being largely used to identify the targets, or is it being used to find new drugs? Is it drug discovery or target yeah. validation? So I, I'm not a big fan of using the, the HapMap cell lines for discovery. Um, I was a big fan until our statisticians did power analysis. Uh -huh. And there's, there's just, you know, there's a huge amount of data. You know, you know, back to the Scottish thing. I thought I'd be able to go in, phenotype these cell lines, get the geno genome for free, and be great. Well, you do get the genome for free, but there's so few samples uh, that you, you, you put them all together, it's 270 cell lines, whatever it is, it's still too few to do discovery uh, for, for a lot of the markers that we're, we're, we're talking about. So. Um, we, we've moved away from that. We now have collections of, of um, unrelated individuals. So we have a, a thousand, um, well, just over a thousand um, uh, European Americans, a thousand African Americans, and a thousand Taiwanese, uh, where we have uh, immortalized EBV, EBV transformed uh, mononuclear cells. So we do discovery in that way mm -hmm. um, because we had enough statistical power. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, several of my colleagues um, do use the HapMap cell lines on a regular basis. And you know they believe what they find, um, and they know my opinion. Um, and uh, more power to them. I, 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 you know, they, they certainly are doing good quality work. Uh, I just don't happen to believe their results because of that. Yeah. In general, should we be concerned with EBV transformed cells? I mean, these are all EBV transformed cells, yes. uh, uh, right. which is not the nicest thing to do. Or, or mic trans, right. you know, transformed cells. Should we be concerned about that? Well, it's, it's one of those necessary evil things. I mean, then, until there's a better way of doing it, um, it's about the only option we have. Um, we, we look, so we look at both copy number as well as, as um, uh, expression of some of the EBV, what is it? So there's a certain phase that we, latency. lytic phase. Um, lit, the lytics and lytic phase genes. Latency. So we use that and put it into our statistical models. Um, and so far, have not seen a big effect of that. But David Altshuler did a study where he looked at copy number, I believe it was, and did see a, an effect of, of um, he was mainly looking at cytostatics, not cytotoxics. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the key thing is that you look. Mm -hmm. And there are some people that aren't even bothering to look, bother to look, and, you know, their results are really hard to interpret. Okay. Do you have a question, or were you... Uh, yeah. Uh, so you had showed your your 5FU data was the toxicity, right? You did a GWAS study against the toxicity. How come DPYD didn't show up? Do you think that these candidate SNPs are really that important, or do you think that you, the GWAS approach is going to be the best way to go? So cell, cell lines. Um, so the the advantage of our of our use of cell lines was that we could actually do a family study, and you know we could do discovery and less cell lines than we would have had to if we did it unrelated. The there is many downsides to using cell lines. First of all, they only represent one compartment of the many types of cells in the body. Uh, we we uh, say they're a, it's a cell autonomous approach. It's our, our cop out. Um, but there, there's a lot of genes that uh, downregulate uh, immediately when they go into culture. Mm -hmm. And DP, DPYD is one of them. And so we've shown in, in uh, mononuclear cells from people that are not transformed 
um, that within a, a couple of hours um, of, of culture, uh, there is uh, less than a tenth of the enzyme activity um, still left. And so it's, they're, they're not just going down in terms of expression. There's active, um, uh, active degradation going on uh, of the protein. Um, and so in, in that case, and in the case of a lot of the P450 enzymes, um, there's, there's, they're not well represented. And we really look at these as more of a pharmacodynamic discovery approach. The pharmacokinetic aspect um, are, are not going to be well rep represented in these cell lines. And, but pharmacokinetics, you can do those studies in humans much easier, not in families, but in certainly in patients. So we kind of thought that was a, a worthwhile trade-off. And, and can you just comment? I mean, we, we had shown that P-glycoprotein polymorphisms were related to docetaxel and paclitaxel neuropathy development, for example, and, yeah. and you just showed us that they're probably not so important. Do you think these candidate well, gene, do you think that candidate gene approaches are good? I mean, they're hypothesis driven, or do you think yeah. that these GWAS studies, do you think they're gonna be sort well, of a waste? I, I think, so if you have good biologic plausibility behind your candidate, then it, the ultimate goal is to ask the question, is this variant real? And having enough samples to ask that question, you know, prospectively plan it, even if it's a retrospective data set, I think is the key thing. Um, in, in terms of GWAS, especially with the pharmacology, the pharmacokinetic part, uh, the, the P450s are either absent or vor very poorly tagged with the, the two available million SNP chips. Um, and so while, you know, you have million SNPs around the genome, you have deserts around a lot of the P450s that we want. And the data that, that the SNPs that are in some of those, I just don't believe at all. And it's because of the gene homology issues. And it's, you know, it's very hard with, for both Illumina and AFI with the current technology approach uh, to, to convert those, those, uh, those assays. The only reason the DMET plus chip works so well is they use the inversion probe technology, which is able to lay down nicely. But even within AFI's products, their DMET plus chip works really well. Um, for, for P450s, their million SNP chip is completely useless. Yeah. I mean, you, you've had experience with that. Yeah, well, I mean, th there, they, there is an instance where, you know, there uh, statins, for example, where they identified a SNP in SLCL1 yeah. via yeah. one, so there, there clearly is some representation sure. of these, but yeah, yeah I agree, it's a, not as, as well covered as something like that. Yeah, so that, that was a solute transporter, and that, um, and, you know, and they got lucky. That's great. Luck is good. Well, I mean, it, it, it was kind of funny, because it was actually confirmatory of some candidate gene approaches right. from, but we already knew that this right, was yeah, related to the, the AUC of yeah. these statins, so anyway, yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate yeah. you. So, so the question, I don't know if there's people actually, it, at Frederick's still there, so but I'll repeat it anyway. Um, the the um, question about complementary techniques for, for picking up new SNPs. The, the no, other, other, other than SNPs. Oh, other than SNPs. Oh, gotcha, okay. Because we are looking at other techniques to find other SNPs as a discovery approach. Um, we, we currently are, are not. Um, the, for, so we currently are not for our, our large population studies, mainly because we're, we're stuck with uh, the, the samples that we have. Now, uh, Jason Lieb at, at, at our place has some techniques for looking at, um, at some of the, um, uh, I guess the, it's not, it's not methylation, it's more, more uh, chromatin, um, the chrom epigenetic. yeah, epigenetic issues. Um, and and he, he's able to, he's been showing some really nice data um, on the, the Ceph cell lines. And so we're now, he's now gonna use some of our patient samples and, and see whether that technique can actually you know, get some, some results that are, that are robust. And so that would open it up for us there. But um, you know, in, in our studies where we have tumor and we're able to look at you know, methylation differences between tumor and normal or between tumors from responders and non-responders, uh, we, we certainly believe that, um, genetics is, that DNA is only one part of, of a very complex issue. And so um, as the techniques get better for the, the late translation stuff, uh, we're eager to apply them. Because we, you know, we, we know that DNA will not be enough. Or at least genotyping SNPs in DNA will not be enough. 